Welcome. We are so happy to have you here. My name is Richard Frost, and I'm a member of the Social Sciences um, Subcommittee on Curriculum. Our team is happy to welcome you to this session today and look forward to learning with Bob. Please take out your cell phones right now and ensure they are silenced mm -hmm. so as not to distract from the day's presentations. Thank you. Also welcome to the crowd joining via Zoom in the Haas virtual classroom. Special thanks to our technician, Gloria Goodwin, for supporting our hybrid modality. <clears throat> are you interested in helping Haas become more environmentally friendly? If so, you are invited. You, we invite you to join other like-membered Haas members for an introductory exploratory session in the Haas classroom tomorrow, Wednesday, October 4 at three o'clock. As another reminder, we will welcome Holocaust sur survivor Tova Friedman to our monthly program one week from today, Tuesday, October 10, at the Jack H. Miller Center for Musical Arts on the Hope College campus. Cookies, coffee, and conversation will begin at 9 a.m. Students, faculty, and staff in the community are all welcome. Tova will be available during the following the program to greet you and sign copies of her memoir, The Daughter of Auschwitz. You can purchase your own, from, own copy of the book from the Hope College Bookstore, Reader's World, or from HASP office, where a limited number of copies will be available after class today. On the day before Monday, October 9, at 3 p.m., you can be introduced to Tova's story when we screen the documentary Surviving Auschwitz, written by HASP member Milt Newsma. This free screening at the Knickerbocker Theater will be followed by a panel featuring the film's director, writer, and producers. We hope you can join us both for those incredible events. Today, we are here to listen to Dr. Robert Cunnan talk about great decisions in the economic warfare. Bob has a PhD from the University of California, San Diego. He worked at uh, Aquinas University for many years as the director of economics and business program there, and then went on to private industry in terms of investments and financials with AIG, Equity of Iowa, and capital formation. So with that, let's welcome Bob to his presentation. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Richard. Uh, appreciate that uh, introduction. Um, you know, I wanted to talk about this subject of uh, economic warfare for some time because it's becoming a much bigger issue. And I'll explain to you why in just a, a few minutes, but just briefly, this shows up here what uh, economic warfare is about. And uh, it says that it's an economic strategy used by belligerent nations or nations seeking to change behavior with the goal of weakening other countries or destabilizing them. And it's a form of mercantilism. Mercantilism is basically an economic system that says a country ought to emphasize their exports and discourage imports. So in a sense, it's the opposite of free trade. And what we're seeing across the world right now is a reemergence of mercantilism across the world. And uh, I'm very concerned about this uh, trend because it says something. I'm sorry, how about that? Okay, is that better? Yeah. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Anyway, uh, I'm concerned about that because it's uh, the opposite of free trade. And uh, being a free trade capitalist, I believe that's the best system in the world to create economic opportunity for everyone. And I'll explain to you why in a few minutes. This uh, <clears throat> quote from uh, Karl von Clausewitz, I think, is very interesting. He was a Prussian general in the early 1800s. And his book on military strategy is still used today at our military academies. They study the strategy that he laid forth in the early 1800s, which I think is fascinating. But this line here, he says, war is an instrument of national policy, including economic war. And he specifically focused on economic war, saying, you know, if you can avoid getting into a, a real firefight with another country, that's a good idea. It's much easier to, to uh, utilize economic war techniques than to get into these uh, major battles where you lose a lot of people. 
And I thought about this. I wonder if Vladimir Putin is aware of this. Um, there's a recent report that uh, the Russians have lost 300,000 troops in 18 months. These are individuals that have been killed in 18 months. Compare this to our experience in Vietnam. We lost 58,000 individuals in Vietnam over a seven or eight year period. They managed to get to 300,000 in 18 months, excuse me, in 18 months. And they're now having to recruit kids that are 15 and 16 years old to go into the service. Could you imagine that? If we did that here in the US, in a lot of cases, they're sending them into a situation where they're not trained to handle. And it's probably going to accelerate the um, uh, uh, deaths over there. I want to mention uh, one thing. I've got a pretty good slide deck here. If you're interested in having a copy of the slides, there's a uh, sheet up front. You can put your name and your email, and I'll be glad to send it to you. The only thing I ask, if you make a small fortune on these slides, if you would be kind enough to send me a subscription or a gift a certificate to Bodie's down in Saugatuck, <laughs> I, I would really appreciate it. So anyway, um, these are the different methods that are used in uh, economic warfare. Um, all of these are used either uh, uh, alone or they're used in combination. With mercantilism growing, economic warfare is gonna have negative and long-term consequences. One of the things I'm gonna tell you is that, you know, we all tend to think that uh, you, all you have to do is do some of this and it's gonna solve all your problems. It doesn't because the evidence shows that when a country implements economic warfare strategies, it lowers the real income in the country that does this, as well as affecting the countries that it's directed to. So there are economic consequences to the use of uh, these kinds of techniques. So what are the examples? And I'm gonna talk about uh, different countries that have used this over a period of time. One is destruction of economic potential. Some examples, no trade. We have no trade with North Korea and we haven't had for a long time. Cutting supply lines. Um, look at what China is doing with Taiwan. China has basically claimed the entire South China Sea and are saying that they control everything in that area. So they're stopping ships right now and searching them to decide whether or not they're gonna allow certain things to go into uh, Taiwan. Cutting off financial sources. The World Bank has cut off Russia from any loans through the World Bank because of their financial situation. That's a pretty big issue. The second one is blacklisting. Uh, telling another country that they'll be subject to sanctions if they trade with a particular country. We have basically said to individuals that if you trade with Iran, that um, there are going to be consequences uh, to you. Um, and that's becoming more and more prevalent. Control of funds. You may have noticed a story that was just uh, came out recently that uh, we decided to deal with Iran to give them back $6 billion of their money that had been held for some time to get back a couple of hostages that were held in Iranian jails for a period of time. What's funny about this is the statement was made that there are restrictions on how they can use that $6 billion. Can you imagine the likelihood that they're gonna follow through on those? Not likely to say the least. They're gonna use it for whatever they want. The fourth one is a blockade of trade. That's going on right now, as I mentioned, with uh, Taiwan. Uh, China is restricting the ships that can get into Taiwan right now. Um, and uh, uh, it's affecting the, the ability of Taiwan to get oil, uh, which is really important to them. Again, that's being used more often. In the Ukraine, Prior to the start of the war, the Russians were blockading 
all ships coming into the Ukraine and leaving. And we forget about the fact that Ukraine started out as economic warfare and it morphed into all out, all out war. And uh, that's one of the dangers in utilizing economic warfare. You never know when the next step is going to be all out war. So export control is the fifth one. Um, the most uh, recent examples of that uh, are Russian oil. Uh, uh, there have been re big restrictions placed on Russia exporting oil. Now, that really sounds good in principle, except you've got a huge black market around the world. And when Russia is selling that oil to other countries on a discounted basis, you think they're going to they're going to abide by any sanctions that are imposed on Russia? If they can get oil on a discounted basis, and they can get agricultural products from Russia on a discounted basis, they're going to go ahead and do it. One of our closest allies in the world is Japan. Surprise, surprise, Japan has been buying Russian oil, and they're buying Japanese, excuse me, Russian uh, uh, agricultural products on a discounted basis, even though they're an ally of the United States. A number of other countries are doing the same thing. So the, there's some major takeaways from all of this. The first is that economic warfare is growing uh, very quickly as mercantilism is emerging around the world. More and more countries are utilizing this strategy. The second is that economic slowdowns are going to affect this trend even more in the next 18 months. Some of us, including me, believe that we're going to experience some real economic problems in the next 12 to 18 months. If that happens, don't be surprised if we see more countries use these kinds of techniques to control the imports that are coming into their country. Here's an interesting question. I wondered about this. I thought, what does the UN say about this? What does the UN Charter say about economic warfare? It's very interesting. The UN says, you can use it, but don't do anything that's going to create a humanitarian disaster. But they never define what a humanitarian disaster is. So you can get away with almost anything. If uh, you feel it's appropriate, a country feels it's appropriate to implement something like this, have at it. There's very little that the UN is going to be able to do to stop it. So I want to go into some specific examples of this. I want to quote this uh, line from uh, Joe Biden. By the way, I want to make it very clear. This is not a Republican or a Democratic problem. This is a responsibility of both Republicans and Democrats way back to the beginning of time. Both Republican administrations and Democratic administrations have used economic warfare as a strategy. So I'm not directing my comments toward any one particular party. But you can see this point that uh, Joe Biden makes here. He says, if we need to use economic weapons, so be it. It's almost a casual line. You know, if we think it's appropriate, we're going to go ahead and do it. And um, that sentiment is growing has been growing in the United States for uh, some years now. Look at Russia. What a mess. Putin underestimated the U Ukrainian resolve. He thought that he could use economic warfare to bring them to, her knee, to, them to his knees. It hasn't happened. In fact, it's made uh, Ukraine even stronger. Look at what happened to us in Afghanistan. You know, we went into Afghanistan and we thought, well, this will be an easy one. We'll be in here for a couple of years and and we'll bring democracy to Afghanistan. Well, that didn't work. Uh, we uh, basically uh, walked away from that situation very quickly in the last couple of years. So the second question I ask is, uh, could Russia implode or collapse with major losses in the Ukraine? In the last 12 months, the Ukrainian ruble 
has dropped by 50% in value. And um, <clears throat> that's huge because it makes it very difficult for Russia to import what they need to have in order to continue that war. Then you have China. Who are you going to trust there? President Xi is pretty much doing whatever he wants in the South China Sea. And uh, there's some blockading going on of Taiwan, as I mentioned earlier. There's growing independence around the world. I talked about mercantilism. And then we have North Korea. Boy, talk about a wild card. You got the now, uh, North Koreans that are now developing nuclear weapons. And surprise, surprise, guess who's now providing all the weapons to the Russians? They've been losing so many weapons. North Korea has now been the primary production source for weapons for Russia. And the North Koreans are getting Russian oil in return, which they desperately need. So sanctions have not worked on North Korea. And I would argue that because the black market around the world is growing dramatically, that the imposition of economic warfare sanctions is becoming more problematic and making it less likely they're going to work in the future. So I talk about uh, Russia using discounted oil. Uh, they're doing it with other ag products. Iran did exactly the same thing years ago. Uh, when we were imposing all the sanctions on Iran and so forth, they were selling oil on a discounted basis to the rest of the world. And nobody cared. Even some of our closest allies were buying oil from Iran on a discounted basis. So what is Biden doing? He's trying to build alliances to counteract Russia and China. The Quad is a, it's a very interesting concept. The Quad is a loosely group of countries that kind of work together uh, in the uh, Pacific area, but it's not really very well organized. And the reason is that China has threatened us that if we try to create something like NATO over in that area, it's going to have severe consequences to us. So we have this loose affiliation with some of the countries over there to try to work on issues in that, but it's not very well organized and uh, quite uh, frankly, uh, not very effective. And the use of these backdoor trading te techniques that I talked about makes this a whole lot more uh, difficult. So I asked a question, or I should have asked a question earlier, what country has uh, used economic sanctions the most in the last 50 years? The U.S. We've imposed 35% of all sanctions. Uh, this was a university study that was done uh, recently. And um, uh, the results of these sanctions are very dubious. Uh, there are longer term consequences that are connected to this. But look at the stats on how effective they are. About 35% of the time they work. 15% of the time, we don't know. Uh, they may work a little bit, but uh, it's uh, indeterminate. 55% of the time, it's outright failure. And my argument is, you implement this, and you lower the standard of living in your own country. Real incomes go down. It affects the real incomes in some of the countries that these sanctions are directed to, and everybody loses. Everybody thinks they can win a trade war. And uh, having studied this stuff for 40 years, I have seen very few examples where countries have been able to win a trade war. Uh, they all think they can, that they have the optimum strategy to be able to do that, but it hardly ever uh, works. So I talk about ordinary citizens suffering uh, significantly, real incomes going down, and sometimes an economic war becomes a real war. And the thing I alluded to earlier, there are all kinds of ways to get around these sanctions and they're becoming more significant. So let's go back to Russia again. Even if Putin is gone, it's
1991 to 1999, he feared the independence movement in Russia and all kinds of things were done in order to prevent that from happening. He also feared NATO, uh, which is one of the reasons why they really cracked down on the uh, population in, the, uh, in Russia. Putin has intensified that theme. I'm gonna show you some of the examples uh, of what he has done since he's been in power, but here's a stat that blows me away. 300 companies have left Russia in the last 18 months. They've ceased operation, they've moved out. Now, I looked just recently, that trend is accelerating right now. More and more companies are vacating Russia, and uh, that's gonna have some major economic consequences to them. So Yeltsin started this. They had a steep economic decline. There was too much regulation. Uh, it requires loans and Russia loses leverage. And my comment is, Russia is nothing more than a giant gas station. 60% um, of their GDP is oil and gas. And by the way, I think the next 20% is vodka. Um, I think vodka may be one of their primary exports. Uh, I have no problem with vodka, but uh, that's not going to cut it in terms of growing your economy. One of the things I would uh, suggest to you, if you're interested, Marvin Kelb, who was a very good uh, CBS uh, correspondent uh, many years ago, he did a number of videos about, uh, in fact, he worked in Russia for a number of years, but he did a number of videos on Russia and the mentality of the Russian leadership and so forth. They're still very relevant and they're worth looking at. You can go on YouTube and watch these uh, very easily and they're very much uh, worth uh, watching. I lost something there. I can't move it. There you go, thank you. This is a fascinating ch uh, chart on economic uh, output. Uh, this is 2022. Uh, you see the US at the top um, shows the per capita income, China per capita income, Japan per capita income, and then you got Russia uh, down there at the bottom. Shows nominal GDP, and then I adjust for purchasing power parity. Uh, that's a fancy economic concept, but what it basically means is that it adjusts the GDP number based on a similar basket of goods and the financial situation in the company, in the country. And you can see that if you make that adjustment, it improves the situation for China. You know, they go from about $17 trillion to $27 trillion. It improves it slightly for Japan, up to about 5.63 trillion. And even in Russia, it improves it, uh, it improves it somewhat. Those 2021 growth numbers, I've been looking for the 2022 numbers. Um, I've got some preliminary numbers, but the bottom line is that 2022 in almost all cases shows a decline and a really big decline for Russia. The World Bank estimates that in 2024, we're almost to 2024, that Russia will experience a 13 to 15 percent decline in real GDP, excuse me, in nominal GDP, and probably uh, a lot more in terms of real GDP as a result of what's going on right now. And I ask the question, if they're going to have that big of a decline, how are they going to continue to fight this war in the Ukraine and to support their people? Well, they figured out the answer to it. Print money. And uh, they got a, a lot of unhappy people in Russia right now, Russian, Russian citizens who are unemployed in that. So they're just printing money. And uh, they used up all of their reserves. And uh, they're just passing money around to keep people happy. Remember the comment I made earlier about the, uh, the, the uh, reduction of the value of the ruble? It's all related to this. 
that when you're printing all that money, the value of the currency is going to go down. It affects their ability to import stuff. And uh, that's very problematic in terms of what's going to happen to them in the future. Okay, so what's uh, what's uh, Putin been doing? Um, I want to tell you a, a kind of a funny little story. Um, back in 1992, I find my, found myself in the unfortunate position of being on the Trump Taj Mahal Senior Secured Bondholders Committee. Um, our company decided to buy some of the Trump Taj Mahal bonds in 1990 and 1991. By 1992, it was in bankruptcy. And myself, Carl Icahn was on that committee and a few others. We had the unenviable task of trying to figure out how we were gonna extricate ourselves from that without taking a significant financial loss. Well, we hired Wilbur Ross. I'm sure you've heard of him to be our financial advisor. I had lunch with uh, Wilbur Ross one day in New York City. And after talking about what we were gonna do with the Trump Taj Mahal, he said to me, he said, you know, I have a lot of clients that are doing business in Russia. One of them is Donald Trump. And uh, he told me these wonderful stories about the issues that Donald Trump was dealing with in Russia. And he made this fascinating comment. He said, you know, if Trump did this in the United States, he'd be in jail. And I found that very interesting that in Russia, you can get away with almost anything. And uh, it then brought up the question, how much do you think that Trump was influenced by Russian influence once he became president? Did this come full circle again after all these years? And not surprisingly, he went to Zelensky before the whole Ukrainian debacle and asked Zelensky to help him influence the decisions that were being made in Russia about his business situation. And Zelensky basically told him to get lost. It's a fascinating scenario. And you wonder how much Biden has been negatively impacted by that whole trump Zelensky relationship. But what I found interesting is that after all these years and what um, was said about Donald Trump by Wilbur Ross, Wilbur Ross ends up in Trump's cabinet. Think about that. You know, he's basically telling me about, about all the misgivings that he had about Trump. And then he ends up in his cabinet. And I find this interesting, by the way, that you have this trial going on right now in New York City. It's not a criminal trial, it's a civil trial. And everybody's saying he produced false records on his net worth. We knew about that back in 1991. Everybody knew that his records on his net worth were not accurate. We used to laugh about it, that uh, we'd see these numbers come out and everybody said, well, cut that number in half and you might get close to what his real net worth is. And suddenly now all of this is emerging in 2023. And individuals in the financial world have always been very dubious about these numbers. And it's not just Donald Trump, by the way. I've seen all kinds of transactions over the years where I get financial records and things like that from developers, whether it's Carl Icahn or others. And you look at them and you just laugh because you know they're not accurate and of all things Wilbur Ross at one point claimed that he was worth three and a half billion dollars not surprisingly somebody a couple of years later said no 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 his actual net worth is about five or six hundred million but it's a big game that if you want to get others to join you on a venture you've got to convince them that your net worth is really significant so you jack all the numbers up. And uh, it, it, it makes me laugh a little bit that suddenly now all of this is coming out 
when this has been going on for a really long time. So in Russia, you've had political re freedoms were reversed. Freedom of the media has been curtail curtailed across the board. Ordinary Russian citizens have no idea what's going on in the Ukraine. They have no idea what the casualties are. They have no idea about the techniques, the economic warfare that's being used against them. The electoral laws are uh, tilted toward Putin and his party. The constitution was modified that basically allows that party to stay in, in power until 2036. Opposition parties or principles are eliminated, discreetly, of course. And one of the great comments I ever heard was, be careful what you eat or drink in Russia. Um, it may be the end of you if you get sideways with the Putin regime. So the question is, should we impose more sanctions on Russia? Well, I thought about that a little bit. The answer is they're probably not going to work. Because as long as you've got this huge black market across the world, and they can sell oil and agricultural products on a discounted basis to other countries, it's probably not going to have much of an impact on them beyond what we've already done. So unless you have a complete collapse of the Russian government, uh, their financial situation com com comes completely undone. I don't think that's going to work. So here's China, and uh, these are some other examples of what they're doing from an economic warfare standpoint. China has basically concluded that the uh, disengagement of the U.S. over the last three years, the political infighting, the deviation from reasonable and enforceable trade standards, um, basically has emboldened China. But look at what they've done. Uh, they retaliated against Japan for a maritime incident. Uh, and imposed a sanction on uh, rarest uh, exports to uh, Japan. They've halted fruit imports from the Philippines for filing an unfair trade practices act. They've canceled Airbus contracts with France for hosting the Dalai Lama, of all things. They shut Nor Norway out of the China market after an activist was awarded, awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. So you have a lot of this going on where China is exercising this power and using economic warfare. So China is using this more and more. But what I would say is that if you look at the numbers coming out of China right now, they've got some serious problem. Their economic situation has weakened considerably uh, in the last uh, 12 months. And it's becoming more and more difficult for them to do some of these things. So in China, not surprising, you have limited uh, basic freedoms. There are no free elections. They're seeking to increase uh, influence throughout Asia and beyond, and they're using economic warfare techniques to do this. Uh, primary uh, President Xi has been everywhere trying to increase their influence. And one of the things is this uh, Belt and Road Initiative. It's a very interesting uh, thing because uh, they're developing numerous ports uh, throughout the Far East. And my comment is do not underestimate the importance of these because it helps them with their trading around the world to have all these ports. They're connecting the continent by rail and road uh, roads, which uh, allows Chinese products to move, freely move everywhere and very cheaply uh, throughout the Far East. Many countries that have come on board, including Thailand, the Philippines, Singapore, Vietnam, and even Japan. All of these countries are supposedly allies of the US. And they're dealing with China very freely. So you also have this situation with uh, the growing China-Russian alliance. This is a real tough situation because we can impose all kinds of sanctions on Russia and or China. But when you got two countries like this working closely together, it makes it really difficult for those sanctions, economic warfare techniques to have much of an impact. 
So anyway, that's uh, one of the reasons why I'm really concerned about where all of this is going to lead. So the question is, where are we going to end up? Let it fly and see where the chips land. Um, what is the Biden game plan? Um, I would argue that it's still a work in pro progress. He's shifting the focus from domestic policy to international policy. But boy, there are a lot of doubts and uh, inconsistencies in terms of what's being done internationally. The bottom line is we're losing our leadership position in the world. More and more countries are looking elsewhere for leadership than from the U.S. And Biden's ability to influence economic policy across the world is coming down significantly. And it's a result of all this polarization that's going on in the U.S. All the infighting that we're seeing right now between the two parties and so forth, the rest of the world is looking at it and saying this is chaotic. Why in the world should we follow the lead of the United States when they can't even get their own act together? And that's a legitimate argument. I mean, if, if they see this going on in our country, why should they listen to us? So we still are using these um, strategic alliances. Um, I talked a little bit about the Quad earlier. We're trying to neutralize China, but you wanna talk about a tough situation. Um, President Xi is a tough negotiator. Uh, you look at what he's been able to get from other countries and the influence that he's had in the Far East. You look at what he's doing in other parts of the world with uh, helping them develop their economies and so forth. Um, they've been much more effective at that than we have been. So our hope is to promote um, more democracy um, around Russia and China. And it's what uh, President Xi fears most. He's already warned us about trying to create a NATO lookalike in that part of the world. And as I said earlier, that's the reason why we call it the Quad. Uh, it, you know, it's this loosely group of affiliated countries who occasionally get together and they talk about policy and so forth, but it's not particularly well organized. So my question is, will it work? And my answer is maybe, but there are a lot of question marks as to how effective this is going to be. Uh, there are a lot of questions about uh, uh, across the world about the uh, policies and a chaotic American political landscape. I noticed uh, overnight that that uh, Florida congressman is attempting to force a vote in the next couple of days to get rid of uh, Kevin McCarthy. You know, talk about dysfunctionality. I mean, you got a Republican Congress and they're fighting about the leader and attempting to remove him. This is supposed to be the congressional party that's directing Congress right now, and they can't even get their own act together. So there's another new uh, big issue, and that's North Korea. And I personally believe that North Korea in the next five or 10 years is, is going to become a, become a bigger threat than China is. Uh, they're exercising their power across the uh, Far East. Uh, there's a very good chance at some point in time they're going to export nuclear weapons to uh, other countries. They're one of the biggest suppliers, as I mentioned earlier, to Russia right now in terms of weapons. All of these SAM missiles that Russia is using in the Ukraine right now, they're coming from North Korea. They're not being produced by the Russian industrial complex. They're coming out of North Korea. So the technology that North Korea has gotten over the last 15, 20 years is nothing short of amazing. I think there's a very good likelihood they already have a nuclear bomb. They just haven't talked about it. There's another question about uh, how is China uh, going to re uh, react to all of these challenges and that. Will China overreach both economically and politically? Um, that's an interesting question. Um, 
you know, we're seeing that uh, in some parts of the world, their influence is going up significantly, but there's also countries that are having some doubts about whether or not to increase the relationship with China because of the economic consequences. I love this uh, quote, and I talk about Saudi Arabia as well. They're another challenge uh, that we're gonna be uh, faced with, but this quote from David Brooks, I think is a really good one. Most presidents can expect to be spot on a third of the time. The next third of the time are question marks and time will tell. The last third of the time they're dead wrong. And uh, I think that's probably pretty accurate. It doesn't matter whether it's Donald Trump or Joe Biden or Barack Obama or George Bush or whatever. The reality is it's really tough to be president. And a lot of times you got to make decisions with information that's not always accurate. Um, circumstances change very quickly. And uh, it's not surprising that uh, he would make this kind of comment uh, of how tough this job is. That's even why I'm somewhat sympathetic to Joe Biden, because I look at all the challenges he has and I think, well, what would I do in that situation? And sometimes I, I have no clue how I would react to that. Um, and, uh, and God help you if you're wrong, because you could have a major problem on your hands. So here's some issues to think about. Does Biden have a comprehensive foreign policy plan? And I don't know the answer to that. Uh, he claims he does. Um, but what I see is a lot of reactive decisions being made. Depending on what the day is and what's going on, they come up with a new strategy. I'm not sure that's a very good uh, way to be doing your uh, foreign policy. Is economic warfare, warfare still a central focus to bring countries in line? Well, I think the administration still believes that it's effective. I would argue that because of what's going on with these black markets across the world, and they're increasing dramatically, that it's probably not as effective as they think it's going to be. And I think it's going to be even less effective in the future as the economies around the world begin to slow down. And there's a really high probability that that's going to happen in the next 12 to 18 months. So I go back to what I said about mercantilism. Mercantilism is going to become a much bigger issue in the next year or two. And that's going to have an impact on the world economy. It's going to have an impact on how fast the world grows. It's going to have an impact on real incomes across the world. And I'm really worried that it's going to have some major consequences uh, across the world. The other big question of, uh, is, is the current Fed tightening leads to recession? What is the likelihood of another stimulus package? And my answer to that is not very good. Uh, you think about it, uh, we now have a $33 trillion deficit in our country. In 2010, our federal debt was $10 trillion. In 13 years, we've gone from 10 trillion to 33 trillion. Think about that. The likelihood that you're gonna get Congress to pass another big stimulus package in light of that is very low. Here's another sobering statistic for you, as I was curious. The Federal Reserve announced within the last month that they were gonna refinance somewhere between 10 and $12 trillion of debt that was maturing. All of this debt was done two years ago, three years ago, four years ago, five years ago at much lower rates. It's now being financed, refinanced at higher rates. There's 10 to $12 trillion that's gonna be placed in the next 30 or 45 days at much higher rates. The debt service cost on that new debt that's being put in place is going to increase the yearly payment from about 400 to 450 billion 
to $800 billion in fiscal 2024. Think about that. So we're going to add four to five hundred billion dollars of debt servicing costs to an already tenuous budget situation in 2024. So when I said earlier that I think we're headed for another year of a two trillion dollar deficit in fiscal 2024, I think it's highly likely just because of that situation, along with the other federal spending that is mandated by all of these programs. So my goal is not to pick on the Biden administration. You can go back over the last 15 or 20 years and say that there's a lot of culpability all the way around. It doesn't matter whether it's Republicans or Democrats, whether a Republican con con Congress or a Democratic Congress, both of them have passed all kinds of programs. The growth of entitlement programs has been astronomical, and it's really hard to get rid of them. I think, uh, as I pointed out to the group last week, uh, Milton Friedman, at one of the great quotes of all time, he says, there is nothing so permanent as a temporary government spending program. Think about that. They pass a program. The next thing you know, it becomes permanent. And is it any wonder that we have 2,200 separate programs that are providing financial support to the American public? It's nothing short of amazing. One of the comments I make is that democracies die from within, not from, not from without. And I think that's true. I think uh, Biden the other day pointed out that you know, there's some real threats that we face out there from some of our own fellow citizens. You see more and more individuals in Congress arguing for economic warfare to be used against other countries. Everybody, as I said earlier, believes they can win a trade war. And the reality is that that's just not likely. Yet, congressional representatives on both sides of the aisle are arguing for more and more restrictions to inter encourage growth within the United States. And I think it's a zero-sum game that's going to uh, simply not work uh, very well. And I already uh, talked about uh, the return of mercantilism. So this is one of my favorite ones. What would Ben Franklin think? And I asked you the same question. What do you think about all of this? I'm really curious of how you would react to this argument that uh, we've uh, discussed about uh, mercantilism, about the use of economic warfare, the direction of the country and so forth. You think it's a good idea? You think it's gonna cause even more problems in the future? How do you think the American public is gonna react to all of this in the future? So I'm curious. Uh, any comments or questions? Bob, Bob, we have our first question already back yeah. here. All right here, and it's going to be, Gloria is going to share it with you. Wait, wait, excuse uh, me, excuse me. We're going to do this. So th this is from Bill online, who says, as an alum of Denison University, 1972, with a BS in economics, and as an MBA from Northwestern, we were heavily steeped in Milton Friedman's Chicago School of Economic Policy. We learned back then the free market capitalism with some guide rails brings the most prosperity to individual people. Therefore, Trump was dead wrong in imposing economic sanctions. They always end up hurting the countries that impose them. Still true today. Here, here. Um, I, um, I concur with that uh, statement uh, uh, completely and um, uh, for some odd reason, um, this mentality that's emerging as a result of this increase in mercantilism, um, and you know, it's not just the rest of the world that's doing this, it's the U.S. as well, because we're seeing more and more of that uh, here in the U.S. That's going to encourage the situation even more of the, this protectionism, um, of looking for ways of reducing imports. A while back, I looked at all the different tariffs by the way, it's really boring to uh, 
to go through the whole list of tariffs that are being put on foreign products here in the U.S. It is amazing how big that list is and what countries that our overseas have to deal with in exporting things to the U.S. It's, a, it's, it's amazing that uh, people even do it, Com companies even do it. And I see that list getting bigger and bigger and more and more restrictions being placed on uh, free trade. He's quite correct. I've met Milton Friedman a couple of different times at economic conferences over the years, and he always talked about the importance of free trade. He was dead right. Uh, some of our best years were periods of time where trade restrictions were kept at a minimum. People forget about the fact that the depression back in the late 20s and early 30s came about to a large extent because of all the restrictions that were being placed on exports and imports. Every country was trying to protect their own interests. And so you had this situation where everything spiraled downward and we couldn't get ourselves out of it. And uh, as I pointed out to the group last week, uh, John Maynard Keynes was smart enough to recognize that at some point in time, the government has to step in to reverse this uh, situation. So anyway, I agree with that kind of comment that was made that um, um, uh, Trump was uh, culpable in this but many others have been culpable in this as well. Yeah, I, I'd like to turn it on its head for just a moment. Uh, it's not on. Oh, okay, sorry. Uh, it seems to me that looking at the hit, the least relatively recent <clears throat> imposition of uh, economic warfare, it that's different from responding by actual warfare. And I, you know, I see, I see, well, we could just say, sure, take the Ukraine, what the heck. Uh, but what do you do? How do you respond when it's not an imposition for us to try to get somebody to do what we want them to do versus actual warfare against? You know, I actually was hoping that you were not going to ask that question because uh, I was going to have to come up with an answer. And I thought, I'm going to be in trouble. Um, you know, the reality is, is that there are times where you have to do something like this. For instance, when the uh, the Russians uh, uh, invaded Ukraine and that, it would have been foolish not to have done something. It was necessary to to impose sanctions on them, given what they did. And I agree with that completely, even though I'm not a big fan of economic warfare techniques. There are situations that come up where you have no other choice and uh, you got to make a decision uh, to do the right thing. Uh, but I would also argue there are a lot of cases where we've used that without thinking through what the consequences are. And I talked a little bit about the consequences that it very clearly affects real incomes in the countries that impose these sanctions on other countries. If you do that, there's a very good chance that it's going to result in additional inflation in your own country. We've seen the impact of inflation in the US over the last two or three years. Fortunately, it's finally beginning to come down somewhat, but it's still an issue. When I see numbers that uh, two out of every three Americans are living paycheck to paycheck, that's very disconcerting. And it says something about our future if people are in that kind of dire financial situation. So, you know, your comment, I think, is right, that that I'm not saying that there are not circumstances where you, you better utilize something like that, but I worry that sometimes we, we do it in an arbitrary fashion. We assume there are no consequences to it. We don't think through whether it's going to really work or not. Uh, in the case of Russia, it's clearly having an impact. But at the same time, Russia has figured out a way to get around those sanctions. You know, there are a lot of people around the world who want to buy discounted oil. There are a lot of people that want to find a way to buy discounted agricultural products, and they don't care. And uh, I think that's one of the uh, dangers in all of this. Um, 
I'm going to be a little radical here. Okay. Last week you said, well, what we should do to try and resolve these things is to write our congressmen, representatives, and senators. Can I take, um, back, can I take back that statement? Yes. <laughs> I, I can. No, I'll tell you why. Um, <laughs> Last Friday, we had the opportunity to see a movie uh, that was put out by a group of people that were disabled. And it dawned on me that the only way that people can get action is if they form a group and actually get the attention of the media in a large scale to make things change. Mm -hmm. Writing letters is not going to do it. Now, unfortunately, the things that you're discussing are rather subtle for the average American. I mean, they're going to realize that things are hurting, but they may not understand why. Mm. And, and I'm not discounting them. I'm just saying that it really is subtle. I mean, without hearing you and, and seeing about how the debt has increased, most people don't pay attention to those things. And I'm not saying that's wrong. I'm just saying that's the way we are. Uh, and mm -hmm. as a result, um, in order for the things to occur that you have recommended so far as tra trying to change things, it really kind of starts with a more basic area. We need term limits in Congress and the Senate. We need to have court reform. Now, can you see a bunch of people sitting out in front of the, the White House or the Senate or the Congress trying to get making demonstrations regarding tort reform or, <laughs> or or term limits. I mean, the problem is that all of the people in Congress, as I see it, are a brand. And they they are they advertise their brand from the money they receive from various entities. And they re what they do with that money is to enhance their brand. And they also appreciate the fact that they've received that money from whatever interest group that is. And so he who pays the piper names the tune. I mentioned that last week. Yeah. And I still feel that that's really an issue. And I don't know, and I'm not sure anybody, unless you can get a whole bunch you know, you can get the city of Holland to, to go out and sit in front of their their congressman and say, you know, tort reform. You know, this and that. I I don't I don't foresee that happening. Well, that's that's fair, but uh, you know, I, I again, I, I'm being a little facetious about this, but um, you got to start somewhere, and um, I probably write on average five or six letters a week to senators around the country and congressional representatives expressing concerns about, uh, one, the size of the deficit and how quickly it's growing and the ramifications of that and the problems it's going to create down the line, let alone the fact that deficit spending is inflationary. And uh, as I pointed out earlier, the debt servicing cost increases are becoming more and more prevalent and are going to crowd out other kinds of things that we need to spend money on. And uh, now, is it effective? Well, I get ticked off too, particularly when I get a form letter back from somebody saying, well, thank you for your comments. Yeah. We may contact you again in the future. Yeah. Um, but I'm going to still continue to do it. Because I think you got to have a dialogue about some of these issues and you got to get in front of people about this to get them concerned about what's going on. Nobody seems to be particularly worried about the deficit right now. I mean, $33 trillion, we've increased it by a factor of three in 13 years. Uh, that's really, in my mind, a very scary situation that we're going to have to come to grips with. But what really worries me is about our kids and grandkids who are going to have to deal with the situation down the line. Um, for the life of me, I can't figure out how they're going to navigate through this situation uh, with that amount of debt. And then I look at the thing and I say, it's pretty much baked in the cake 
that we're going to be looking at two trillion dollar deficits well into the future each year, if not more. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. My my question, uh, Bob, is is uh, may sound trivial to the group. So, and if I get off on a tangent, just tell me shut up. Okay. No, no, I. <laughs> okay. You don't need to worry about too simple. Too simple issues. I go off on a tangent all the time, so don't worry. How does everybody ship to and from Hawaii? Does anybody know in the room? It's very simple. You always do it in Vancouver or es is it Escondido, the city south of San Diego. You never ever ship out of Los Angeles or oh. San Diego or Seattle. Why? Because we have the Great Jones Act. So the, the freight from Chicago to Honolulu via Vancouver over the Canadian National Railroad in a ship is probably one third of what the freight is via Los Angeles. So that's an example of policy. How do you move your household goods if you're trying to move from here to Detroit? Well, move, the state of Michigan knows everything, including the Public Service Commission. So the simple way out is you ship all your household goods to the Ramada Inn in Fremont, Indiana. You say, well, wait a minute, I'm not moving to Fremont, Indiana. No, but that's the prepaid bill of lading. Then down at the Ramada Inn, you fax them a uh, bill of lading and you say, I want to ship collect to my house in Royal Oak. You, well, did, you did research on all that? I, I, this is my business that I was in. Oh, <laughs> So if you ship directly from here, it's double because the you're shipping over 40 miles in Michigan and they can't touch interstate transportation, but the Michigan Movers Association wants the higher rates. Mm -hmm. So that's the way you can get around the problem. My question is, is your lecture have loads of these types of stories that are causing weird economic situations? Oh, I, I mean, the, um, you know, some of the stories that I've heard from um, people that are pretty well connected in Washington about how programs get approved. Uh, there is no such thing as a program that gets eliminated. Um, uh, when I get letters from uh, congressional representatives or from our two senators here in Michigan, everyone start, every one of them starts out, well, we're looking at this new program. The most recent one was on veterans benefits. We're going to enhance, uh, this was from Gary Peters, we're going to enhance uh, veterans benefits and so forth. I have no problem, by the way, in, in terms of looking for ways of uh, helping uh, veterans in that. But Every letter I get from whether it's Debbie Stabenow or Gary Peters or some of the senators I hear from in other states, I get a letter. We got a new program we want to pass. And my reaction to that is who's going to pay for this? Um, I don't see any I don't see any evidence that uh, they're going to increase taxes to pay for all these new programs. What I see is they're going to pass it and it's going to immediately go into the deficit. And instead of having a $2 trillion deficit every year, a few years down the line, it's going to be 3 or $4 trillion. I think that's unsustainable. I don't know how in the world you can increase the deficit year after year like that without creating enormous problems down the line. And I may be crazy, and uh, maybe, I'm, um, maybe I'm a little... Uh, 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 psychopathic about this, that somehow it's going to uh, result in a severe economic situation down the line, but I'm worried about it. I know that it's going to increase the inflation rate uh, going forward if we continue to go down that path. If we continue to just arbitrarily pass one new program after another, we create more of an entitlement society. That's going to be problematic uh, down the line. And uh, I hear people occasionally talk about it. Uh, you'll, you'll, you'll get some Republican congressmen or even some Democratic uh, congressional representatives who say, you know, we need to begin to look at this. But I don't see any outrageousness, anybody who's really outrageous about this, who is really raising cane about this. And I think that's uh, very worrisome that there seems to be this attitude, no big deal. Uh, we'll deal with it somewhere down the line. Problem is when it finally hits and we really end up in an economic mess, I don't know what we're gonna do then. I honestly I don't have a solution. Well we've been worried we've been hearing these things for 70 years. 
yeah. at least during my lifetime, since I started reading the right. uh, the, the, the magazines that, that worry about debt. And there is a school of thought out there that debt is not that big a problem, uh, that uh, we can run deficits, we print our own money, we most of the money is circulated within our society. And in fact, during all these years when the deficit has been going up so drastically the last 10 or 15 years, the economy has, has been very strong. Uh, the, the interest rate has been, the uh, inflation rate has been very low. Yeah. Uh, the current inflation is probably due to the uh, yeah. uh, perturbations of, uh, of COVID. Yeah. So um, uh, would, I, I, mean, I, I agree we can't go on forever. I mean, we can't have, we probably can't have a hundred billion, hundred trillion dollar deficit. Yeah. But uh, till now, uh, we're, I think we're in uncharted waters. Uh, and um, uh, maybe it's, uh, we're, we're, we're crying wolf when we um, shouldn't be. Well, I certainly have been accused of that in the past. Um, um, in fact, um, my wife just said to me last night, as I was reviewing this presentation with her, she said, you know, I'm going to have to have a glass of wine after listening to what you just said. She said, this is the most depressing thing I've ever seen. And um, I, it's hard to dispute that. Um, but I, 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 I could be dead wrong about this, uh, that, um, uh, that this is going to become a much bigger problem in the future. When I see the debt service costs that are going to increase by uh, $400 billion a year next year, because of all this rollover of financing of treasury bills and things like that, that's a big problem. <laughs> but it still adds to the deficit going forward and it reduces options going forward. Uh, it's like saying to a company, um, you know, don't worry about your debt to equity ratios. No big deal. You'll figure out a way to get to get around it in that. And my comment is, I've seen too many companies over the years that don't worry about that and get into severe trouble. There's a very good chance that Russia is going to default on their debt sometime in the next uh, 12 to 18 months. <clears throat> and uh, that's going to have enormous implications because they hold some U.S. treasuries. Uh, not many, not much, but uh, that's going to have a big impact. They're not the only ones. We're in a, a very difficult uh, financial situation. So, you know, am I being uh, really cautious? Yes, I am. When I see the uh, U.S. national debt go from $10 trillion to $33 trillion in 13 years, I think that's a big problem. And, uh, and uh, it's going to crowd out other kinds of investments in the future. Um, one example, one example of that, by the way, is I saw a uh, report this morning, only because I'm interested in the oil and gas industry, that it's estimated for us to meet all our requirements in the oil and gas industry in the next 10 years, they're gonna have to spend $10 trillion on infrastructure. And I'm thinking to myself, where is this 10 trillion gonna come from? I'm not sure the oil and gas industry is positioned to be able to do that. Some of them already have a lot of debt. They got to come up with $10 trillion to be able to produce enough oil and gas going forward. And that's assuming that the administration even allows them to do any drilling. Right now, we seem to be going in the opposite direction where we are reducing the number of acres that can be used for oil and gas drilling. Everybody says, don't worry about it because we're going to have, we're going to have EVs and uh, that's going to solve all of our problems. Did anybody ever ask the question? Okay, did anybody ever ask the question of how are we going to provide enough electricity for all these EVs? You remember what happened this summer in Texas, Louisiana, Arizona, where they were talking about blackouts because they didn't have enough power capacity? Our electrical grid is not very good. Go ahead. I'm yeah, it was a failure of the uh, I'm sorry? Okay. Okay, my turn? Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. Okay. You, you heard about I, I just, my comment earlier about pontificating. 
And I do a little bit of that. Well, my turn to pontificate then. <laughs> <laughs> and so in my pontification, here you're paint, painting all these global pictures of gloom and doom, which I totally agree with. But how are we going to solve this? Well, look around in this room. Most of us aren't, aren't going to be here 10 years from now. So now we're, now we're relying on, on the younger generation. The younger generation is now caught up in this mania of we're going to have the perfect world. We don't have to look at across internationally. Why don't we just look at California? Why don't we look at some of the laws California is passing? How in the heck do they get away with that? I don't know, but I, I appreciate your funny making me look good. You're... <laughs> Here, I was the one who was providing all the negative information. Now we got that to look forward to. You know, I refer, I refer to that, by the way, as accelerated depreciation. Um, um, you know, that we're all, we get up every morning and we, we're all finding new and new ailments to uh, worry about and things like that. And uh, and then I say, well, you got death to look forward to. Well, we said it's going to solve all those problems. So, but okay, let's let's everyone say thanks to Bob. And then if you have other questions, come on up so and sign the sheet. I want to show one other thing here, just to show that I'm not totally off the mark here. Is this quote? I'm an old man and I'm doing a great many troubles, but most of them never happen. So, so just remember that I may be way too pessimistic about where we're headed right now, but the reality is that we all make a lot of very bad predictions and things of that nature. And I could be dead wrong about where all of this is going in that. If Mark Twain could come up with a line like this, you know, maybe he's right that uh, we all tend to worry about everything. And you think about that in your own life, a lot of times it never materializes. So let's hope that uh, it turns out better than than what I predicted. Thanks, Bob, for your great Thank presentation. You Appreciate it. Thank you. If, if you'd like to have a copy of the slides, it's still up here, so feel free. Oh. Oh. 